Brett Contreras. That's right. The man is literally made for the job. Let's talk about glute training and range of motion. Welcome back, Dr. Milo Wolf here with you today, PhD in sports science, reacting to Brett Contreras' take on range of motion and muscle length as it relates to training the glutes. I am actually on good terms with Brett in general, and we've discussed range of motion and muscle length as it relates to training the glutes before. So my suspicion is I'm going to agree with most things here. But let's get into the video and see what I agree and disagree with. Should the gluteus maximus be trained at long muscle lengths or short muscle lengths? for maximum results. In this video, I'm gonna roll through the four existing studies pertaining to gluteus max muscle length. Uh, I'm gonna discuss the available evidence and then talk about physiological concerns that we still need to figure out. I'm gonna list off the 10 longitudinal studies that need to be conducted for us to really have a good picture to allow us to answer the question. And I'm gonna finish off with nine important considerations. So I hope you're prepared to kind of put on your nerdy biomechanics hat for a while because this is going to be a little bit scientific. It's not going to be as sexy of a topic as some of my other videos, but it's not just very important, it's vital for the future direction of glute training. At the very least, I'm very excited about this topic and I hope that shows through. So right now, there are four studies. One by Kubo, one by Cassiano, one by Plotkin, and one by Mao. But there are 25 total studies on this muscle length debate pertaining to all the muscle groups, okay? So four of the 25 pertain to the gluteus maximus, but 21 belong to other muscles. Now, in general, the evidence shows that training muscles at longer muscle lengths is more effective than training them at short muscle lengths. Now, the problem is almost all of these studies are on beginners. And here's what's hilarious. Kind of a recent topic. There are already seven review papers on the topic. And this topic is gaining momentum. If you're in the strength training and sports science realms, then you hear about this topic all the time. And right now the pendulum has swung towards longer lengths, but is there a role for shorter length training, especially for the gluteus maximus? And how can we get to the bottom of this debate? So the Kubo study showed that deeper squats were more effective at building the gluteus maximus than shallower squats. Now, I'm skeptical of these results. And the reason why is because they only mentioned knee angle. They didn't mention hip angle, okay? So you can squat very upright and just move your knees forward and achieve a certain knee angle and barely work your glutes. Converse, if you get a wide stance, take a low bar position and sit way back and spread the knees, you're gonna feel your glutes a lot. So you can achieve the same knee angle in two different scenarios but one of them has you filling all quads, one has you filling all glutes. They did not show pictures in this study, and I emailed the authors and never heard back. So, skeptical of Kubo. So I get what Brett is saying here, and I do agree on principle that it's important to consider how exactly they made them squat, but generally, all else being equal, if you don't give participants specific instructions, you just tell them, squat as deep as you can, or 240 degrees, what have you, they will have more hip flexion when also going into deeper knee flexion. So it might be difficult to trace back exactly what their joint positionings were for the shallower versus the deeper squat, but I do think the deeper squat condition was in all likelihood training at lower muscle lengths, which ultimately makes this study a comparison of training at lower muscle lengths versus shorter muscle lengths in the context of the same exercise. And so at the very least, I do think the study shouldn't be disregarded and should count as a study in favor of training glutes at lower muscle lengths for hypertrophy. The next paper is by Cassiano. And this study showed that if you do leg press and stiff leg deadlifts, and then you add hip thrust to it, you see better results. So basically one group did leg press and stiff leg deadlifts. The other group did leg press, stiff leg deadlifts, and hip thrust. And the group that did hip thrust saw better results. The problem with this study is, was it due to just more volume in general, or was it something special about hip thrust? The study wasn't designed to answer that question. But it did show that hip thrusts do work. They do build glute muscle. The third paper is by Plotkin. Now, I was involved in this study. My buddy Menno Henselmans and I funded it, and it looked at squats versus hip thrusts. And it found that squats and hip thrusts built the glutes fairly equally as well. So this showed pretty much a one-to-one -one relationship between squats and hip thrusts for building glutes. Now, squats were more effective at building the quads and the adductors, and neither exercise built the hamstrings or glute medius to much degree. And finally, we have the recent Mao abstract, and it basically looked at straight leg hip extensions off the multi-hip machine. It looked at two ranges of motion, basically a full range of motion versus a partial range of motion. But the full range of motion wasn't really full, 
and the partial range of motion didn't stretch the glutes that well because it's straight-legged. So if you really wanted to look at the effects of muscle length, you should have taken the glutes into a deeper stretch by performing bent leg uh, hip extensions. And then finally, you should have went all the way back into full hip extension, full hip hyperextension. They went to neutral, they went to zero degrees, they should have went into full hip hyperextension, which is like, you know, textbooks and like studies will show about 15 to 20 degrees. But in real life, when you train people, they move that leg back pretty far. So my guess is that this was, you know, I mean, to me, this was just comparing like, you know, partial to partial, but they didn't maximize muscle length or muscle shortness. So this study didn't look at a big glute stretch or a big glute squeeze. So in my opinion, it was designed more to pertain to sprinting because they wanted to look at the effects on sprinting. I agree with this. I don't think the study was perfectly designed to answer the question of within the glutes, but I do think that it is comparing a very long and nearly full range of motion for the hamstrings and to a lesser extent for the glutes to a length and partial for the glutes. And so yet again, Certainly you can say that this isn't the perfect study design to answer the question, but it is a good study design to answer the question of, on average, does a longer range of motion or a length and partial lead to more hypertrophy in the gluteus maximus? And in this case, they saw over twice as much hypertrophy in the gluteus maximus when doing a length and partial versus when using a full range of motion. But so far, by and large, besides just pointing out some of the limitations of the study designs, I think Brett and I agree. These are the only four studies I'm aware of as well. Uh, we've discussed this before. And generally, I do think that this body of evidence lends credibility to the idea that, hey, the glutes should be trained at lower muscle lengths, all else being equal if you're aiming to maximize hypertrophy. But let's see where it goes. As of July 30th, the time I'm filming this video, there are only four relevant papers to the gluteus maximus. So before I get started into the studies that need to take place to answer this question, I want to discuss some physiological concerns that we need to figure out. And there are basically four of them that we really need to answer to allow us to make predictions, to form theories. Ideally, the theories would match experiments, you know? It's nice when you really understand the mechanisms responsible for the hypertrophy, but right now, we don't know enough yet. So one really important physiological mechanism that we need to look at is when you get down into the bottom of a squat, the glute max is not activated highly. Now people say, oh, EMG this, EMG that. But if a muscle is not activated highly, then how would it grow maximally? Because if, if it's just about stretching a muscle, then people who did yoga would be jacked. And all you do is sit there and stretch. Now there are studies showing stretch does build muscle, but it's very inefficient. You know, you can stretch a muscle like three hours a week and get the same muscle growth that takes you, you know, 20 minutes in the gym. So I have not published this yet, but I have had 12 subjects get into the bottom of a squat and I load the bar up with too much weight. They can't actually squat the weight up, but they get under the bar, they get in their squat position and they push up as hard as they can for five seconds, okay? Then without moving, they push out against, their, their knees are blocked. They're in the same exact position. There's a bench on the left and right side of their knees and they push out as hard as they can. So basically you're in deep hip flexion and you're performing hip extension, then hip abduction. Basically on average, you're firing the glutes two to three times harder when you push out in deep hip flexion compared to pushing up. So in deep hip flexion, the glutes appear to be more abductors than extensors. So I would love for this to be duplicated. I, I wish a few different labs showed this you know, I can envision the title of the paper being, in deep hip flexion, the primary role of the gluteus maximus is abduction, not extension. That would really blow people's minds because we think when you're in a deep stretch, the glutes are in a good position to push upwards and get you out of the hole, but they're not firing as hard as they could be. So hopefully this gets published and a bunch of other labs confirm it. So if you're a master's student or a PhD student, you're looking for a study to perform, please carry this out on your own. We could talk about surface EMG and muscle length, but keep in mind you're in the same exact position. Muscle length doesn't change, so surface EMG is fine here. I think this is fairly interesting. I am not going to speak to whether or not that's true. What I will say is from a practical perspective, we have the Kubo study looking at squat depth and measuring glute hypertrophy, showing more glute hypertrophy when going deeper. So I'm not overly concerned about the fact that the EMG in the glutes is relatively low, if they're actually growing more from the empirical studies we have actually looking at growth from squatting deeper. And as Brett pointed out, and as we're both aware of, EMG has 
a number of limitations when it comes to drawing inferences to hypertrophy. The second physiological mechanism which might help explain the first is this neuromechanical matching theory. Basically, the theory states that as a muscle gains leverage, or as a muscle improves its moment arm, which is a term for leverage, then basically the nervous system recruits that muscle to a greater degree. And that makes sense. Basically, if the brain and the central nervous system was trying to be efficient, it would know this muscle has good leverage. It's effective in this position, so I'm gonna activate it to a higher degree. Now, we do have a bunch of moment arm studies. I think last time I counted, there were like eight. Um, the first being Nemeth, which I've referenced a lot over the years. And we do know that as the gluteus maximus progresses from deep hip flexion, a deep stretch, to full hip extension, its leverage does improve. Maximum leverage is at, you know, around neutral, um, and it's like probably two and a half times greater at around neutral than it is in deep hip flexion. So we do have EMG studies, but most of it's using surface EMG. Ideally, we'd have more sophisticated technology to ascertain whether the gluteus maximus does in fact ramp up its neural drive from flexion to extension. Moving on, there are no studies published on the length tension relationship of the gluteus maximus. Now I'm talking about the active, passive, and total force angle curves. Meaning, how much force does the gluteus maximus produce in deep hip flexion all the way to full hip extension? Now bear in mind that there's active force and passive force. Active force is produced when a muscle is activated. It's more the sarcomeres contracting, right? Passive force is elastic. It's non-activated. It's independent of activation. It's just via stretch. Now, when a muscle is activated and stretched, it does produce greater force. But we really need to look at bodybuilders. We need to look at hypertrophied glutes and really look at the active, passive, and total force angle curves because bodybuilders have big muscular glutes. Where is maximum active force production? Is it towards neutral? Is it in a stretch? Is it at 15 degrees, 30 degrees of hip flexion? And how much passive force do you get? Now here's the deal. Biomechanists like me like to use OpenSim. It's a free software that lets you plot all these different curves. So you can look at the active and passive and total force angle curves of the gluteus maximus, but you get totally different results depending on the model you use. So I use this Rajagopal model from 2015, and if you use that model, you get one plot, and there's another Catalini, I think 2017 model, and if you use that model, it gives you a totally different plot. And if you really delve into the software, you look at what changed, the authors change like the tendon slack, and that produces a totally different curve. Now, how do you even estimate tendon slack for the gluteus maximus? Are the modelers just plugging in data, trying to make it fit? Are they basing this off relevant physiological data? And with the gluteus maximus, you've got a lot of fascia. 70 to 85% of the gluteus maximus attaches to fascia, not bone. So it's an interesting, challenging muscle to model. And the fourth physiological mechanism to investigate would be corticospinal excitability in different joint angle configurations. So there's one study published on the arms, like, you know, the arm muscles, and it, it basically looked at the, you know, nervous system's excitability, like its preparedness to activate in different arm positions, you know? The biceps and triceps were, it was, <laughs> I can't remember the paper that was, it's been a while, but there were different, there were unique positions that maximize neural drive to the muscles, and that might influence hypertrophy. We may find over time that we should be putting the muscles in that position, but it would be nice to look at that for the gluteus maximus, particularly in deep stretched positions, you know, versus shortened positions. I agree with Brett Hay by and large that we need more research in this area. I also think that one potentially viable predictor of hypertrophy versus EMG would be T2 MRI. We have a couple of studies now looking at T2 MRI as a predictor of hypertrophy by uh, a Japanese lab, I'll put it up on screen right now, generally showing that T2 MRI might be a better predictor of hypertrophy than an EMG. And likewise, there was a recent study looking at T2 MRI readings during the leg extension exercise performed with different degrees of hip flexion. Now, their findings in terms of what hip position elicited the greatest T2 MRI activation 
actually also aligns with one study I'm involved in that hasn't been published yet in terms of how much hypertrophy leg extension produced in the rectus femoris. So to my knowledge, there's a couple of studies by the Japanese lab, and there's now the alignment between that one T2 MRI study in the leg extension and our own results in terms of hypertrophy, broadly lending credence to the idea that T2 MRI could be a decent predictor of hypertrophy. But certainly I think that we need more research into this sort of thing. You need experiments to match theories, and experiments are the most important thing. Experiments tell you what does happen, not what should happen. So here are the longitudinal training studies. Longitudinal means a training study, meaning you do some pretesting, you carry out an intervention lasting, say, you know, six to 12 weeks usually, and then you do post-testing and you see what actually happened when you put these people through a resistance training program. Now, there are four studies looking at isometrics and the effect of isometrics at different muscle lengths on muscle hypertrophy, I have four new ideas just for the gluteus maximus. Now, these 10 studies are gonna progress from kind of more proof of principle to more ecologically valid, meaning to prove a principle, you'll have to keep things very isolated and very simple, but it usually doesn't match what we do in the real world. But a lot of times, what we do in the real world it doesn't really answer the question well. I'll explain this more later. The first is to perform electric muscle stimulation at long versus short muscle lengths. So I don't think this would convince everyone. It would just be an easy study to do. Have people hook up EMS. Now, EMS grows muscle too. I didn't think it did, but there's a ton of evidence in support of EMS. In fact, I bought an electric muscle stimulator and I use it on my clients all the time um, when they're visiting. But yeah, I basically... Um, I thought it would be fun. You can watch TV and grow muscle, but it's actually kind of stressful. It hurts. In order for it to be effective, you have to crank up the intensity. It's not fun. But you could have EMS done at short muscle lengths and at long muscle lengths and see which led to greater growth. That's an easy one. Now, the second idea that I have is my favorite. My favorite of all 10 studies. Seated glute squeeze versus standing glute squeeze. So these are isometrics. It'd be very, a very easy training program because you could have people do it a lot. You could probably tell people, you know, do it for 20 minutes a day. Try to basically, you know, be leaning forward and squeeze your glutes, you know, flex your glutes as hard as you can off and on for 20 minutes every day for like, you know, two months or something like that. And then also have people standing, squeezing their glutes as hard as they can. See if there are any differences. That would be a very effective study now, the third and fourth isometric ideas I don't like quite as much, but you could do a multi-hip machine or an isokinetic dy dynamometer. The multi-hip is done standing. The dynamometer is, some of them are standing, but a lot of them are supine. And you could basically have people do isometric, you know, hip extension in a long muscle length versus a short muscle length, like deep stretch versus full hip extension. I don't like these because if you've used these, it's kind of, it doesn't feel as natural. Single leg stuff doesn't feel quite as natural. And like when you're standing, you know, doing isometrics, you can, you, f you know, the, the stretch feels better with the multi-hip, but at end range, you kind of, you almost need to stabilize yourself because gravity is not stabilizing you. It's that front hip flexor stabilizing you. So I don't like these, that idea as much. And then also you could do hip thrust isometrics. You could do this double leg, in which case basically you have people do isometrics in a, the bottom of a hip thrust. They push up as hard as they can, and then they do the hip thrust lockout, push up as hard as they can. Which group sees better results? The group that does long length isometrics or the glute that does short length isometrics? Now, you could also do a single leg study, um, and you could do single leg hip thrust, basically. Single leg hip thrust in the bottom, single leg hip thrust in the top, and when you use this study design, it's very effective because you could have each subject serve as their own control, meaning every subject, like one leg does like a single leg hip thrust in the bottom position and the other leg does it at the top position. So each participant serves as their own control. It increases statistical power. Which glute grew more? The one that did in the stretch position or the squeeze position? Now, the fifth idea has to do with full range versus partials. Now, there are 11 existing studies looking at full range versus partials, and there are three studies, this is a more recent field of, of interest, looking at partials in the stretch versus partials in the shortened position. So 14 total studies looking at basically full range versus partials or partials in the stretch versus partials in the squeeze. So it really depends on how you categorize it. 
if you simply look at studies that have included a partial range of motion at shorter muscle lengths and a partial range of motion at lower muscle length, group or condition, then we actually have nine published studies to my knowledge. However, some of these studies also include comparisons of full range of motion to partial range of motion. So they have a full range of motion group, a shortened partial group, and a lengthened partial group. So there's some overlap into how you categorize those. But by and large, I agree with Brett here that we need a variety of studies to really answer the question in depth. Some of these designs are going to be much more heavily proof of principle, and I'm not sure how well would generalize to actual practice, but that's exactly what Brett is saying here. And that's to perform thrusts or squats or both. I think it would be awesome to do both squats and hip thrusts. So basically, you could have three groups. With the Plotkin study that Menno and I funded, we each spent 40 grand. So it was $80,000 because you want to use MRI. So to have three groups would be 120 grand. So these don't get carried out very often, but it would be cool to have three groups. One group that does full range squats and hip thrusts. The next group does bottom partials for squats and hip thrusts. And then the third group does top partials for squats and hip thrusts. And what I like about doing squats and hip thrusts you know, the deep squat feels a little natural for the glutes than the top squat, but the top of the hip thrust feels more natural for glutes than the bottom of the hip thrust. So it's balanced in, in my opinion. Now there are seven existing studies right now looking at differing torque angle curves. Um, basically the effect of the strength curve on muscle growth. Now you can have an exercise that works you hard in the stretch, but it's easy at the lockout, or you could have a muscle that's easy in the stretch and hard at the lockout. One example of that is the Plotkin paper. Squats are harder for the glutes in the stretch position, whereas hip thrusts are harder for the glutes in the squeeze position. So there's seven existing papers on this, and I have five different ideas on this topic for the gluteus maximus. So I think that this requires a bit of caveating. There are seven studies, but these studies often involve the comparison of different exercises. Different exercises vary in more than just the resistance curve. So for example, the squat versus hip thrust comparison in the squat, you're also involving your quads to a much greater extent. So there are other muscle groups that could give out first, but by and large, I agree that there are some studies looking at resistance curve and its effects on hypertrophy. Let's see what he says. Now, the Plotkin paper already looked at hip thrust versus squats, but a lot of the skeptics said, well, why did they choose squats? Why didn't they choose RDLs? Why didn't they choose lunges? Why didn't they choose single leg leg presses? So it'd be nice to have a study like the Plotkin study, but looking at hip thrust versus RDLs or lunges or single leg leg press. Now the second idea would be the same single leg design I already mentioned, where each subject served as their own control, but it would require really strong subjects, very advanced subjects, because you'd want to use a Smith machine here so that each exercise was very stable. But you'd have basically each subject on one leg, they would do Smith machine single leg squats. And I don't think it should be a lunge or a split squat because you're really, that's not everything on one leg because the other leg is gonna do single leg hip thrust and you want it, the other leg in the air. You could do B stance, but if you do B stance, you're gonna use that glute a little bit. So one group, one leg basically does the squatting motion where it's hardest at the bottom, and the other leg is gonna do the single leg hip thrusting motion, which is hardest at the top, and you see which glute grew better. So again, you can have, if you have 20 subjects, you'd have huge statistical power. And you'd only need one MRI because you could look at each glute independently. Now the next idea is my second favorite idea next to the isometric seated versus standing glute squeeze idea that I had. And this is to use band or chains or both. Basically, you're gonna use bands and chains with squats or hip thrusts or both. I think it should be both of them. So one group does basically squats and hip thrusts using accommodating resistance, meaning at the bottom, you know, it's say, I, I did chain squats the other day. At the bottom I had 225, but I had 130 pounds of chain. So at the top, it was 225 plus 130. So what is that, 355? I did a set of 10 and my glutes were screaming. I felt my glutes more during chain squats than I do during regular squats. And the last couple reps kind of felt like a hip thrust because it's way harder at the top. So there currently aren't many studies looking at hypertrophy with bands and chains. There's tons of studies looking at strength, but I'm not sure if there's a single study looking at uh, band re like barbell plus band resistance on muscle growth. So this would be pretty cool. And then the other group would just do regular free weight, um, you know, barbell squats and hip thrusts. So you'd have to kind of try to um, equate load somehow. 
but basically one group would just perform straight weight and the other group would do a combination. This is where it's easier at the bottom, harder at the top. So that's a study I would really like to carry out. <clears throat> the next example would be awesome, but these don't quite exist yet for the glute drive. Have you guys ever used the hammer strength? They call it the squat lunge machine, but everyone does deadlifts off of it. If you look at the top loading pin, it starts out further away from the fulcrum. And as you rise up, it moves closer. So basically the resistance arm starts out longer and ends shorter, meaning it gets easier throughout the range of motion, meaning it's harder in the stretch. Now the Rogers pendulum squat allows for the same exact thing with the squat. So you can choose a loading placement where it's harder at the bottom, easier at the top, and then both machines also have a different loading mechanism that makes it more consistent throughout the range of motion. So you could design machines that had, like think of in the case of a, a, a hip thrust or the squat of the deadlift, basically where when you're at the very bottom, it's straight out. And then as you rise up, it moves closer to the fulcrum, meaning it gets easier. And then you could have another loading placement that's down like this, where it's closer to the fulcrum, and then as you move through the range of motion, it gets harder, it comes out further, it swings up. And you could make them complete opposites one of one another so that they have opposite strength curves. And you could have one group do, say, squats and hip thrusts, you could add in deadlifts, it could be just squats, just hip thrusts, um, just deadlifts, or all three, or two of them, say squats and hip thrusts, similar to bands and chains, but basically one group does it where all the loading is in the bottom and it gets really easy as you come up versus the group that does all the loading at the top and it's easier at the bottom. That would be a really cool study, but this doesn't exist yet for the glute drive machines, but I am working on that right now. So Brett and I have actually discussed all of these study designs before and he's very smart when it comes to designing studies. I had some input as well. And by and large, I agree with everything Brett is saying here. People don't appreciate how hard it is to carry out a study oftentimes. Uh, it's expensive, as Brett mentioned earlier. $80,000 for a study is not cheap. That is to say nothing of the work involved by research assistants in the first place to carry out the training, get trained up on the equipment needed to measure stuff. So training studies take a lot of effort and that's why you don't see studies on every topic conceivable out there. And the 10th idea for a training study, which would probably be the most ecologically valid, would just to be a vertical hip extension training program versus horizontal, okay? So basically, and this was funny when Mike Roberts and Daniel Plotkin came to me, this is what they wanted to do. I've talked about this idea for, I think, like 12 years now. Uh, I remember blogging about it years ago that this needs to be done. Vertical versus horizontal hip extension exercises. So basically one group would do, say, pick three of these, squats, RDLs, lunges, step ups, split squats, you know, then pick three of these, basically hip thrusts, glute bridges, back extensions, cable kickbacks. So basically say on Monday, the vertical group does squats, Wednesday they do RDLs, Friday they do lunges. And the horizontal group, Monday they do hip thrusts, you know, Wednesday they do kickbacks, and Friday they do back extensions. Which group grows their glutes better? And that would be very ecologically valid because this is what people are doing in real life. So each of those 10 training studies and the four physiological experiments that I mentioned those will be 14 puzzle pieces that would really help us form a big picture of what's more effective training at long versus short gluteal muscle length. However, I do wanna mention nine considerations here that you really need to think about. And the first one is advanced subjects. There are no studies on the glutes using advanced subjects and very few in general using advanced subjects on, out of all the 25 currently published papers, only a couple of them use advanced subjects. So. We need more studies looking at advanced lifters. The second consideration is combined groups. Now, as I mentioned, this is true. Off the top of my head, I can think of one study by Godo and colleagues in the triceps that use participants with at least one year of training experience. Um, I don't think I can think of any other studies that have used advanced subjects within this data. Obviously, I'm just going off memory here, so I might be missing one or two studies, but there are very few. And that's why I'm working on a study this summer, in fact, that will be looking at the effects of lengthened partials versus full range of motion in the upper body in trained lifters who've been training for at least six months using a within participant design where one arm's being trained through a full range of motion or one side of the body and one side of the body is being trained through lengthened partials only. But indeed, we need more research in trained participants. I agree. In the Plotkin paper, we wanted a combined group, but it would have been 40 grand more. Also, in general, research is carried out by students. For example, 
Daniel Plotkin is Mike Roberts' PhD student right now. He oversaw the squat versus hip thrust paper. You gotta do it in one semester and you're limited in manpower. You know, you can have your fellow students and colleagues help you, but having like 60 subjects would be a nightmare. That's why you don't see a lot of these in sports science. But it, it would be cool to see a combined group because, because in the real world, we don't have to choose between long or short muscle lengths, we can do them both. And that's what all bodybuilders currently do. You know, if they're training biceps, they might do an incline curl, you know, basically leaning, leaning back on an incline to stretch the muscle. They might do a preacher curl to really load up the stretch. They might do a concentration curl to load up the squeeze position. They might do a hammer curl, you know, to work the brachialis more. But basically, most bodybuilders do a combination of long length stretch movements, short length squeeze movements. So if the combined group saw better results than the stretch or the squeeze group, than the long or short group, then that kind of validates what bodybuilders do. And it'll also paint to multiple mechanisms of hypertrophy. Right now, we don't know what grows muscle. What are the signals and sensors? I agree with Brett here. Very few studies out there are ecologically valid in that they use a program that is something that people in real world would use. That being said, there is at least one study on range of motion I can think of that somewhat did this. A study by Pedrosa and colleagues in the quadriceps compared doing a full range of motion on leg extensions to doing bottom half partials to doing top half partials to doing both bottom half partials and top half partials. While we're not talking about a variety of exercises here that are designed to target the peak squeeze and the full stretch and what have you, there was some variety or at least a comparison of using a variety of ranges of motion to just using one. And in this case, the length and partial group generally did see still better hypertrophy of the quadriceps compared to the group doing both bottom half partials and top half partials. But I agree, on principle, we need way more studies like this looking less so at what does range of motion do for hypertrophy in a vacuum, and more so at what does range of motion do for hypertrophy when it's applied in context of something you would do in the gym. But what about nuclear flattening, you know, the nucleus flattening out? What about the sarcomere squeezing together? Are there anything in those Z-discs, like, you know, filament three, bag C or whatever, bag three filament C that senses that and responds to activation. What structures of the cell are sensing, you know, the forces and then converting those, you know, through mechanotransduction into chemical signals? Is it the Titan filament? Is it, you know, the nucleus? Is it the primary cilia of satellite cells? Is it the extracellular matrix? Is it the integrins? Is every structure involved or is it just limited to like, you know, one or two or three things? We don't really know, but that would be a cool proof of principle paper for multiple mechanisms of hypertrophy. The third consideration is a lateral group. You know, we're mentioning long versus short muscle lengths, but it's all hip extension. What about abduction? It'd be cool to look at abduction because abduction grows the gluteus medius the best. In our Plotkin paper, Squats and hip thrusts did not grow the glute medius substantially. Well, the glute medius and minimus are part of the glutes, but no one talks about lateral movement. The fourth consideration is using different volumes and frequency. In the Plotkin paper, we did twice a week, you know, between three and six sets per session, but, you know, hip thrusts don't beat you up as much as squats. Well, it might be that long length is more efficient, but short length you can do more volume with. So maybe short length with you really load up the volume, maybe short length is more effective than long length at really high volumes and frequencies. So for example, what if you hip thrusted five days a week? Would you see better gluteal growth compared if you squatted five days a week? The fifth is similar, but what if volume was not equated? And basically you went off of perceived recovery. You know, the groups were told you can train as soon as you feel recovered. So maybe the squat group ends up squatting, you know, twice a week, maybe three times a week when they feel recovered, but maybe the hip thrust group ends up training five days a week because they don't feel so beat up. You go by perceived recovery, so it's like an auto-regulated plan based on how you feel. In that case, would shorter lengths see better results than longer lengths? Who knows? The sixth consideration is looking at injury and soreness data. Would the long length group experience more dropouts? Would they experience more soreness? Would they be more fatigued and beat up by the end of the study? Because that influences long-term results, you know? Cool, maybe hammering squats and deadlifts and lunges is awesome for your glutes, but if you do too much volume, you're gonna get anterior hip pain and femoral acetabular impingement syndrome. You're gonna get low back pain or like, you know, injuries to the discs and ligaments. Maybe you're gonna have knee pain. Maybe your quad or patellar tendons start acting up. So which are safer, longer or shorter muscle lengths? 
Does it matter? According to the repeated bat effect, we adapt to long length training and eccentrics, but how well can you adapt? And do long length stress other structures other than the muscle and does that impact recovery and overall results? From my own personal experience, I do think that you can adapt to lower muscle length training reasonably well. I wouldn't say I experience more soreness now than I did when I was focusing less so on a lengthened position. And I've been doing nearly exclusively lengthened partials for the past nearly year and a half now. So take that for what it's worth. I talk about how in Booty by Brett we do 36 sets a week, okay? In general, like in general, okay? In general, around a third of those, so 12 sets, would be vertical hip extension exercises. Another third would be horizontal hip extension exercises. And then another third would be lateral. So how cool would it be to have four groups? This will never be conducted. This will never be carried out because it would require four groups. You'd need like at least 15, ideally 20 subjects in each group because you'd probably have some dropouts. So you'd need like 80 subjects and you'd need basically, this would cost like, you know, several hundred grand to carry it out. It will never get done. But how cool would this be? One group just does the 12 sets of vertical per week. One group just does the 12 sets of horizontal one group does the 12 sets of lateral per week, and then one group does all three of them combined. So what this would allow us is basically we'd say, here's an optimal program. You know, the optimal program had you doing a combination of vertical, horizontal, and lateral, but the vertical led to this much growth. The horizontal led to this much growth, and the lateral led to this much growth, and basically the lateral built the upper glutes, you know, the glute medius and minimus more, um, does lateral contribute to glute maximus growth? How much? You know, does vertical build the lower glutes a little bit more and horizontal builds the upper glutes a little bit more? That's what I always thought based on EMG, but the Plotkin study did not show that. So this would be a really, really telling study, but it'll probably never occur. Two more considerations. We need a cheaper way to carry out these studies, a less expensive way. So MRIs are very expensive. Can you use ultrasound to look at muscle growth? I've used ultrasound, I didn't trust myself. It was hard, it was really hard on certain subjects. I did a, a twin experiment. I could see the fascial border underneath for the twins, but I, I looked at a few other subjects, like my girlfriend at the time. I kept adjusting the gain, the depth, and I could not see the fascial border, and I just didn't trust it. So to use ultrasound, you gotta have an experienced technician, but is it, other muscles are a lot easier to look at using ultrasound because like with the biceps, you see the bone. You don't see a bone with the gluteus maximus. So how does ultrasound using a good skilled technician stack up against MRI? And are there any other methods using other technologies that would be more cost effective? Because if so, we could crank out a lot more research. And the last, the ninth consideration I want to leave you with is... Yep, I agreed regarding ultrasound here and I think in general within the data, I suspect that ultrasound reliability, the reliability of measurement, is being overreported in the data versus what it actually is. Which ranges of motion should we use for these studies? Which exercises? What limb number should we do unilateral or bilateral? You know, when you do single leg hip thrust, you don't get as high of glute activity as when you do double leg hip thrust. Should we be using lunges? If so, how do we maximize stability? Should we use a Smith machine? And how deep should we go? What range of motion? So if you're doing lunges, should you do walking lunges or just reverse lunges or should you do deficit reverse lunges? In my experience, when I do walking lunges, my glutes get more sore than when I do deficit reverse lunges. Because when you do deficit, the knee moves forward. You have a forward shin angle. When you do walking lunges with a long stride or just reverse lunges, you can have a vertical shin angle. And when the thigh is roughly parallel, you maximize torque at that bottom position. So torque on the glute is maximized kind of at parallel depth with squats and lunges and things like that. And if you go deeper, the deeper you go, torque starts diminishing. So at long muscle length, should we be aiming to achieve maximum stretch or maximum torque? And in the stretch position, you know, should we be trying to abduct it all or should we be trying to externally rotate it all? Regarding the question of whether you should be aiming for maximum stretch of the muscle or maximum torque, I tend to think nowadays, based on some more recent research, some of which hasn't even been published yet, that maximum torque is more important. First, we have a study by Zabalita, Corda, and colleagues comparing the incline curl to the preacher curl, or essentially an exercise where we're prioritizing muscle length at the expense of tension, to an exercise where we're prioritizing tension over muscle length, or peak torque in those stretch positions. And the exercise where tension was prioritized, aka the preacher curl, 
did seem to lead to more favorable growth overall. Likewise, an unpublished study I'm currently involved with compared two conditions. In one condition, cable cores were performed with the shoulder neutral, but with the resistance curve set up such that it would peak in the lengthened position. In the second condition, with the other arm, the bicep curl was trained with the shoulder behind you in hyperextension, increasing the stretch on the biceps, but with the same resistance curve set up to peak when your biceps were lengthened. And to make a long story short, hypertrophy of both arms was very similar. So it seems that when peak torque is already set up to occur at relatively long muscle lengths, stretching at least the biceps within this context in this one study to be even more lengthened didn't seem to increase hypertrophy. And so when given the choice between increasing muscle length even further or increasing the torque at that muscle length, I would typically go for torque. I think torque might be a little bit more important. Too early to say for sure, but that is my suspicion. You know, I think the Plotkin paper showed that you can grow the glutes in beginners well from either squats or hip thrusts, indicating that muscle length might not be as important as we thought. So does that mean that if you're doing deadlifts, you could do conventional for greater stretch or sumo, which theoretically would be, be better for activation with the abduction extra rotation, but there's only one study looking at that with Escamilla that didn't show that but hopefully you get the point. Is conventional better than sumo? Is narrow stance with a deeper stretch more effective than wide stance? These are all things that need to be figured out over time. And these nine considerations are important with the 14 experiments that I mentioned. Nevertheless, think of all of this as a puzzle. You've got all these puzzle pieces. Right now, we only have a few puzzle pieces. We've got four existing studies all on beginners. We don't have a grasp of the physiology yet. We don't have nearly enough training studies, but as we learn more, as we gain more puzzle pieces, the big picture becomes clear. And I talked mostly about glutes, but this pertains to all the muscles right now. We should always be striving for improvements. I hear people say, oh, everything we learned about strength training we knew 100 years ago, nothing is new. We're always learning new things and we should always be striving to maximize our understanding, pushing the envelope for, for better training programs and better understanding the mechanisms because that allows us to design better programs. Okay, that's a wrap. I hope you enjoy the video. Thank you for watching. Please hit like if you enjoy the video. Please make sure you're subscribed to my channel and definitely leave me a comment and let me know what you think. Thanks for watching. So that wraps up my reaction to Brett's video. Let me give you my closing thoughts about glute training and whether or not you should be training the glutes at longer or shorter muscle lengths. What I wanna say up front is that Brett is really smart about glute training, or training in general, in fact. I think he has a point to it. We don't have all the data yet. With that being said, my personal stance is that if you have a generalizable principle across a variety of muscle groups, the glutes, the quads, the calves, the biceps, the triceps, that longer muscle length training tends to result in more hypertrophy than shorter muscle length training, that is one big piece of the puzzle. When you add to that, that the four studies that we have comparing longer to shorter muscle length training, some of these studies have their limitations. Like I don't think a comparison of the squat and hip thrust is the perfect comparison when it comes to answering the question of whether shorter or longer muscle length training is better. They're inherently different exercises, but nevertheless, we have four studies looking at this concept. Out of these four studies, the Kubo study and the Mayo study, the Kubo study on the squat depth and the Mayo study on the multi app machine, pretty clearly show substantially greater hypertrophy when training the glutes at longer muscle lengths using the same exercise. Meanwhile, the other two studies, one by Cassiano and colleagues, where they looked at adding in hip thrusts on top of leg press and RDLs, and the study by Plotkin and colleagues where they compared squats to hip thrusts. These are the two studies that didn't equate for the exercises being used or for volume being used. The Plotkin study found no difference in glute hypertrophy between the squat and the hip thrust, and the Cassiano study found that there was greater glute hypertrophy when adding in hip thrusts to a program consisting of leg press and RDLs. The Cassiano study really just tells me that the hip thrust effectively grows the gluteus maximus, which is good to know. I personally think the results are mostly attributable to additional volume, as Brett pointed out. And the Plotkin study tells us a couple things. One, we see similar glute hypertrophy between the hip thrust and the squat when the squat isn't being performed to a particularly deep depth. The silhouettes from the study are available online, and you can see that most participants weren't really squatting all that deep. However, what that study also tells us, besides just that the squat and hip thrust grow the glute similarly, is that the squat specifically hones in on the gluteus maximus hypertrophy. While the squat also grew the quadriceps a pretty good amount, the hip thrust really mostly just grew the gluteus maximus. And so if nothing else, the hip thrust is a highly specific exercise allowing you to train the glutes very well. But as far as raw hypertrophy of the glutes, forgetting about other muscle groups, I do think lengthened exercises will produce more overall hypertrophy as evidenced by the Mayo study, 
and by the Kubo study. So my take is that the glutes do benefit from lengthened training, but the hip thrust is a great exercise if you're specifically trying to seek growth in the glutes. And honestly, I'm really impressed with Brett in general. Like, if I had to give a score to this video, which is absurd because he essentially just talked about research the whole time, and I loved every second, I would give it like a 9 out of 10. It, it was really solid. My takeaway, train the glutes mostly at lower muscle lengths, but if you want to be super safe and conservative, you can still include some shorter muscle length training and hip thrusts as well if you specifically want hypertrophy of the glutes and not many other muscles. That is the video. If you enjoyed the video, please like the video, comment, subscribe. I know this video is a bit heavier on the research than usual. It was a bit more abstract, but I really enjoyed it and I think Brett is smart. If you'd like me to coach you, check out the link above and I could become your coach. Have a phenomenal day and I'll see you guys in that next one. Peace.